so what I wanted to do, um, basically, uh, the, I, I uh, actually would, would probably go a step uh, below Pearl's knowledge of genetics. I, I guess I have a first degree relative. My father uh, is a biochemist and, and uh, sits in the world of genetics, but, but my own training is around organizational behavior, organizational change, and how do we actually try and uh, improve the healthcare system in which way we can. So I think there are two major things. If I thought about uh, the first, ah, this slide. Um, I think we're still uh, missing the boat to some degree. We're still seeing research and clinical care as these completely separate entities, and I think that hasn't worked very well. Uh, the barriers between research and practice, in some sense, are a function of identifying these as completely separate endeavors when, in a sense, we're trying to get the best possible information uh, toward improvement of health. So I think the ideal world uh, that at least I'd like to see is where research and clinical care become much, much more the same, that there's an acknowledgement that the same level of rigor, the same quality of data uh, is what goes into making uh, decisions about any individual patient uh, as that which makes decisions about the broader knowledge base. And I know it's not something uh, with all of the barriers that is a, a, a simple uh, flip of a switch, but it's something that at least we're aspiring to. Um, so I think about it in two different ways, one of which is what's been discussed a lot about translating research into practice and thinking about the fit between the innovations that we're creating and, the, and then the practices, given the constraints, given the challenges, uh, but also given the opportunities. Thinking about the salience of the outcomes uh, that people within practice are looking for compared to the outcomes that we're generating through research. And really, uh, it's come up a lot thinking about to what degree there's a strength of evidence, to what degree uh, on the practice side are we able to support clinical practice change. What certainly we've seen doesn't work is assuming that the publication or, um, or the lecture or the individual training as a standalone thing is going to do much to change practice. Now, thankfully, at this point, we do have a growing uh, science around dissemination and implementation research. We have a knowledge base that's developing, and NIH, um, though this isn't uh, as well known to some, has been uh, at least trying to increase the, the size of this portfolio and the quality of this portfolio over time. Uh, so just to anchor you around these questions that are coming up out of these demo projects and potentially thinking not just about best practices for implementation, but studying them uh, within, uh, within clinical practice, within a whole range of practice settings, uh, we have R01s, we have R03s, we have R21 uh, announcements that are, that are standing that have now 14 and hopefully uh, uh, more to come, 14 institutes that have signed on to this. Uh, NIMH and, and the National Cancer Institute have, have been more vocal than, than some, but there's an increasing number. There's also, as Mark had mentioned, a dedicated annual meeting where, as he said, maybe a practice group of uh, experts around implementation science could come together with, with some of you. Well, there's 1,200 of those folks who are coming to uh, Bethesda, the uh, North Bethesda Marriott on March 19th and 20th. I think some of you will be there as representatives, but it would be nice to see more of that crosstalk because ultimately, you know, discoveries that sit on the shelf don't really benefit many people. Um, so so uh, in addition to that, just there's often a concern about uh, the review needing to be much different. Well, we've been at least pleased to see that the Center for Scientific Review at NIH has convened a special panel. So people who are studying in this space, actually trying to advance knowledge around uh, dissemination and implementation have uh, an expert panel to go to. Um, so that's actually progress that we've made, and it turns what before was an afterthought in terms of research, much more in terms of this is part of the research enterprise, that if we can't figure out that last link of how to get widespread benefit, then, then we're certainly falling short of our task. And it's not, certainly in mental health we're doing that, we're falling short, um, but broader within healthcare, we know that we're falling short. We can average that any evidence-based practice is being uh, accessed by uh, a minority of the population, and those are of those who actually access care. So if you take out care, um, then you lose a lot of people, maybe half if you take out those who are accessing care but not getting uh, best care, you take out another, another quarter. So you're down to maybe a quarter, maybe less, who are actually getting effective practices. Um, so I'd so love, to, love to hear more, even though I have to run, uh, love to hear more from uh, you with your ideas around these demo projects of how do we take them in larger scales. As was said, implementation decisions may be local, but in other cases, they're state, they're national, there's opportunities to do something about it. Uh, the other side, I think, really is, again, around that uh, idea of fusing research and, and clinical care in a much more directive way. 
Um, certainly, at least from what I've gleaned uh, in terms of genomic research, there's a continual need for large samples. There's a continued need to at least position this in terms of how does it maximally become relevant to health systems, um, and, and certainly checking the broader validity of findings. We know the limits of any individual study, so trying to figure out a way that we continue to check validity over time within healthcare settings seems to be quite useful. Um, again, NIH is at least trying to move into the space. Uh, those of you uh, who are uh, who work at least with um, the, the HMO Research Network have seen that over recent years there's been a number of institute-specific efforts, the Cancer Research Network, the Cardiovascular Research Network, um, Emerge, as well as our Mental Health Research Network that is trying to use existing healthcare networks where there are researchers and clinical care settings uh, potentially together with information system to try and uh, narrow that gap to make it actually reality that we're doing more, more research within clinical practice and, and uh, that in turn is feeding back to make sure that we've got the right answers and that we're even answering the right questions. Um, so, so NIH's Common Fund initiative has been focused on this HMO collaboratory of seeing to what degree can these integrated health systems uh, research and practice go together in, in a much more uh, formalized way. Uh, we've heard from the VA already today of nice models in which healthcare dollars are actually going toward research development. This is something that I think uh, we could at least explore in, in a much greater way. And when we think on the federal side at some of our sort of practice uh, agency colleagues, HRSA, SAMHSA, et cetera, uh, um, as well as the VA and, and Indian Health Service, we ought to do a better job of seeing that where there's opportunity for uh, shared resources, we can, we can get further than we are. Um, so I'm, I'm basically going to stop there, but it's sort of a plea to not get too bogged down in this idea of these silos uh, will and, and potentially should always uh, exist, but rather thinking about breaking them down. So that's my thoughts. Thanks. Does David have to leave any specific questions for David? You're not getting up that easy. No. Yeah. yeah. So I heard an invitation. Yeah. Uh, Expand on that just a bit more. Um, if there were a group or a subgroup of this group that were to attend the meeting, would it be possible to um, set aside or, or develop a little sidebar meeting in the context of the larger meeting uh, to maybe discuss some very specific issues? Yeah, so I think it, it's a good point. There's, there's certainly uh, to be a, a sort of directed invited session around the interface of, of genomic medicine and practice. But in addition to that, yes, there are a, a number of networking opportunities. People in the past uh, from, from outside HHS entirely and outside health entirely, education and, and, and child welfare and, and justice have come together in this kind of a thing. So there's no reason why we wouldn't have space and opportunity to do that here. So yeah. Your thoughts on a, on a whole different model of changing clinical practice, which doesn't involve this uh, paradigm, and that is we know from the pharmaceutical companies with DTC advertising, that changes practice. Why not ha have this all come up through consumers and the public to drive it rather than trying to uh, get the medical community that is uh, basically ossified to change anything? Yeah. No, I think it's a great point. And actually, uh, you know, whether, whether you call it patient activation or sort of, uh, you know, increasing consumer demand, it's absolutely something that we look, uh, that, that, that we don't look to enough. I mean, some of the challenges at, at least, uh, it, you know, happen to be money. There's certainly a lot of money going into the enterprise that gets uh, the information directly in the, in the hands of consumers where, where we're thinking about pharmaceuticals. But yes, I mean, one of the challenges is we're only often focusing on the supply. How do we make a particular thing available within a clinical setting or within uh, insurance? And we're not thinking about how do we increase demand. The autism folks have done a really nice job of galvanizing around here's what we need uh, in, in terms of to advance care for our kids or, or, or care for the population and have done a nice job of figuring out how do we turn that both into research and clinical uh, advances. And I think, yes, there's tremendous opportunities. The same patients like me is another place if people have, have seen that particular website, but where you have, it's entirely, you know, patients going on and saying, here's, here's what clinical care I'm experiencing, here's the symptomatology, here's what I'm, uh, you know, th so there's an activated group that we're not usually looking to. So I think it's absolutely a great point. But the flip side of that is that DTC advertising resulted in bad prescribing and practically bankrupting our country because of inappropriate use of prescription drugs. 
and the autism community has has also been perpetuating the notion that vaccines cause autism. There was a front page article in the Memphis newspaper last week titled "Vaccines: Yes or No." Mm -hmm. I mean, so consumers, you know, can also drive us in the wrong direction, and that's why it's our responsibility to come to a consensus. <laughs> Yeah, like any powerful tool, it can be misused uh, entirely. And, and yeah, I mean, it's not to say that there's been the cure-all on, on any side where what's resulted yeah. is the best possible practice, but it would be unfortunate not to look to that as an opportunity. Yeah, just to come back, I, I think DTC advertising should be banned. I'm not supporting it. I'm just saying it's remarkably it effective. And the other thing, yeah, I just want to be clear. Uh, the other thing that I think is, be, is not um, being appreciated is that there's ability to move people more than ever before, and that whether it's Arab Spring or Occupy Wall Street, there, there's a way to do that in an effective way, that is, when there, where there is the appropriate evidence. Uh, so it doesn't have to be, you know, the evil pharma. Well, and, and, and going, you know. <laughs> okay. I think going to Target, too. I mean, the direct-to-consumer advertising did exactly what it needed to do in terms of improving market share for the, these different products. If it was predicated on trying to optimize and improve clinical practice directly, the, the actual advertising might have looked a little different. Thanks so much. I think on the advertising thing, you know the ads got milk with the thing? We had this, this great billboard uh, in Boston that has this person that says, got plague? And it shows, you know, some dead rats. And it says no because of research, which I thought was incredibly effective. It only lasted a day and a half, though. So, I mean, it surely was not politically correct. Um, Erwin, would you like to go next? Or Dave? Or do we have a volunteer? Yes. 